The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit give us the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of God's word into the seven compartments of our stream of consciousness for our own benefit. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. On the way home tonight from work, I was listening to the radio about uh, certain things that uh, banks are doing today, such as Bank of America charging $5 for a card or to use the debit card, and everybody was in a tizzy over that. And uh, the reason why they're having to do that is due to a Dodd-Frank bill, which, uh, well, government stuck their nose into capitalism, Capitalism is God's divine system, divine establishment. They think they're smarter than God. They try to make it better. They only make it worse. But at any rate, everyone blames the bank anyway. And then I started to think to myself, I am in two occupations in which I could be the most hated person in the world. A banker and a pastor teacher that teaches doctrine. Well, that's how life goes, and I enjoy every minute of it. This is where God wants me to be. And one thing about being a pastor teacher, you have to develop a tremendous amount of grace orientation, and at the same time, a tremendous amount of, I will not use colloquial English, but I will just say a tremendous amount of I don't care, or I don't give a, and then you know. And that is concerning what people think. And that has to do with the fact that hypocrisy is something that all of us have. And hypocrisy is uh, something that definitely those who are on the legalistic side have. But it does not escape the antinomian either. And uh, this brings me to a story of an antinomian. And uh, he was, he's not going to go to church because of the, all the hypocrites in church. And so he, he goes up to the pastor and, and this is arrogant to start with. Not that he goes up to the pastor, but what he says. He walks up to the pastor and he says, I never go to church, boasted a wandering member. Perhaps you have noticed that, pastor. Yes, I've noticed, said the pastor. Well, the reason I don't come is because there are so many hypocrites here. The pastor said, oh, don't let that keep you away. There's always room for one more. All of us have that tendency of self-righteousness, no matter whether we jump into the antinomian side or the legalistic side. We have an old sin nature, and there's one thing about the old sin nature. It's contradictory. If you've ever run into a crazy person who constantly contradicts themselves, you say, what's that all about? It's about someone who has allowed the old sin nature along with all the facets of reversionism and emotional revolt of the soul to control them to where they are totally hypocritical, judgmental. And that's where we find the church today, and that's where we find the church in Acts chapter 2. It's never changed. There's nothing new under the sun. 
But uh, one thing we have to learn is to grow in grace and in knowledge. And the best thing we can ever understand is the prophecy of the priesthood. And that's because we know that we represent ourselves before God and no one else. Others will crit criticize. Others will try to force some type of guilt manipulation upon you. And sometimes they're successful. And that's part of the weak trying to control the strong. And as a pastor teacher, if you have the gift of pastor teacher, and I know of a few young people who do and are, they're going to be in for a big shock. And, uh, they already, they already have gone into a big shock because they go into, uh, areas where everyone calls themselves a Christian. And they give some principles of doctrine, and the next thing you know, they are talked about like they're the devil. That's the occupation, the occupational hazard, just as being a banker. You know, all those people out there protesting now against Wall Street, they're hypocrites. And we have a man running for president, Herman Cain. I will not endorse anyone on... Uh, uh, through a message. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm not going to tell you who I voted for until maybe after the election. But uh, I do like this man. And I can have that opinion. Herman Cain. He was uh, giving a speech. And he's uh, a very relaxed man. And he has a great sense of humor. And he's as far as personality goes, he seems extremely likable, and he reminds me a lot of Ronald Reagan, a different personality, but a lot of Ronald Reagan in that how he handles things and how witty and quickly he can come up with something that people just can't criticize. And people are always ready to criticize. That's the old sin nature. And so some protesters started shouting, and they were shouting, "Tax the rich! Uh, they want the riches. They want the riches from those who earned it. In other words, they're thieves, and they want to legalize theft, which has already occurred in this country through a progressive tax system. And they were going on with their Marxism. And then Herman Cain smiled, and he looked at them." And he said, if you're not rich, blame yourself. That ended the protest. Well, what we're going to see in Acts chapter 2 is the ending of a protest. Why? How does it happen? Boldness. Being courageous. Not compromise. Sticking with principle. Now, I've been talking about politics, and I've been talking about life in general, and sticking with principle. And if it's important to stick with, with principle, with life in general, how much more important is it to stick with principle when it comes to God's word? I find myself becoming more and more and more indignant toward those who have fallen, as, it, as the Apostle Paul says, they're shipwrecked, or as it, as it comes out in the English, fallen from grace, but that's not really what it means. Uh, you don't fall from grace, you depart from it by your own volition. And believers by the thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, who used to know a little bit of grace, are now shipwrecked. And guess what? That makes this country the Titanic. I had a short conversation today with Moses Amobiko, the a missionary who was ordained at Baraka Church and is now going all around the world to uh, various areas that uh, are dangerous, to various areas in the Middle East where there is response, uh, to areas in India where he has had response, He went to Pakistan, and he said he's going to go back. He, he says it's 
he says it's like going into the eye of the storm. But he and but he's going to Pakistan alone. He's not going to let any of his uh, the people, his entourage, go with him. His entourage includes uh, Debbie Hagar along with her husband and uh, maybe a few others because they're white. And Moses says no. And and then I I asked Moses. I said, well, what if Debbie wanted to go over there? Uh, does she think it's safe? And he said. Even if she told me she wanted to go over there, I will not let her go because she's white and immediately they assume American. And if you don't know it, Pakistan is where some very brave soldiers shot Osama bin Laden right in the head and his soul went right to Hades. And so it is a very dangerous place, especially for Americans. And he says, he didn't put it in these terms, but he was trying to uh, relay it in such a way that I would understand. And I just filled in the words. I said, well, because you're, he said, well, they're not going to bother me, uh, but they will bother uh, Debbie Hagar and such. And he didn't, I guess he didn't want to talk about the race aspect. And I said, well, because you're black and they don't know if you're Muslim or not. And he said, that's exactly right. And uh, so he's able to go over there and do this without much trouble, but it's still dangerous. And he goes all around uh, the Middle East, up into Pakistan, and he told me about his uh, mission even to London. And I said, well, how was that? And he said that was very successful. There was tremendous response in London. And I, I, I told him, I said, uh, that's, that's different. I said, uh, I always thought of Europe as extraordinarily degenerate. And he said, uh, yes, but the, I, I thought that too, but that has begun to change, especially in the United Kingdom, according to Moses on Mobico. And then I said, well, I sure do wish that would happen here. And he said, I do too. And so we are in a terrible spiritual malaise in this country. There are people hungry for the word of God, and we are the client nation. We're just like it, Judea was during the time when Peter is going to preach in Acts chapter 2, which is where we're going to be in a moment. We're just like that. Hard-headed, arrogant, believer and unbeliever alike. And, uh, well, no nation survives the prosperity test. It's never happened in history. And we're on the downside of that prosperity test. So we're losing it. We're losing our prosperity. Even the Bible talks about how a man with great wealth can squander it very quickly. And it's actually referencing the spiritual life. And there are so many people who are squandering their wealth because they have tickling ears. They can't stick with one doctrine. If they're bored with something, if something sounds dry to them, they'll go on to something else. And that is not, that's arrogance. And God has a system of perception that we must follow, a protocol And uh, so, yes, there are hypocrites. There are hypocrites in churches. You've been a hypocrite before. I've been a hypocrite. Look at yourself in the mirror. And try to look at it without bashing it with a two by four. Just look at yourself in the mirror and you'll see you're no damn good. You have an old sin nature. But grace comes along. What do you have? Rebound. You know, with rebound, one second you can be no damn good. And after you rebound, the next second you are under the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And you then possess the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now that's grace. You went in one second from hypocrite 
to having the power, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, you may say, well, I can't raise anyone from the dead. Uh, you don't understand what I'm trying to say in the English language because English is an extraordinarily, uh, English can be misunderstood and misapplied in so many ways. And it's very difficult to communicate in English. If we all knew Greek, the communication would be much better. So I have to try to think and put it in a different way. So I could say that, uh, uh, well, I don't know. It's so difficult. I don't even want to think about it. Let's just turn now in our Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verse 14. And we will move on uh, from there into the interlocking systems of arrogance and uh, why people reject the word of God, why people reject the gospel of Christ. And we're going to find out something about religion, about legalism. Now Peter, it, now, Peter had a trend toward legalism. This comes out in Galatians when the apostle Paul publicly ripped him a new you-know-what. And I mean publicly ridiculed Peter. Publicly. And you know what Peter did? Did he walk out of the, out of what did he say? Bye, Paul. I'm done. No. In humility. Later on, Peter said, if you want to learn something deeper, go to Paul. Humility. And that is something we lack in the United States and most people lack around the world. And that is why we see so much danger. Now, if you're a believer growing in grace and knowledge, you're protected. I notice it in my life. And if you were to observe your life, if you're positive toward doctrine and you've grown spiritually and uh, you've broken through that door of hope. Or if you are associated with anyone who has and you have been blessed by association, you know right away. That if you're being blessed right now during these economic times, God protects the elect. And when I say elect, I'm not talking about the elect in terms of simply being saved. I'm talking about the elect according to the calling of the few, the mature believers. And those blessed by mature believers. That's why David said, I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. And do you want to know something? I haven't either. I have never seen a person positive toward the word of God begging for bread. Never seen it. Have you? I have never seen... Someone in uh, spirit, not, it's not to say that it doesn't happen occasionally as a part of their testing. But, you know, I'm talking in general. And so was David when he said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Of course not. And then he goes on to say, nor their seed children begging for bread. Blessing by association. And this nation would have been long gone 70 years ago, if it weren't for the fact that in our past, we had parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, all the way down to some of our founding fathers, not all of them. Some of our founding fathers were unbelievers, but they understood divine establishment principle because they understood humility and freedom. We're so far gone from that. But not to get too far off course, I just uh, want to let you know the reason why we even still have a modicum of prosperity, and we are prosperous. I mean, yes, times are hard, and if you're without a job, you're saying, who's prosperous? You're saying, I'm prosperous? It's like the saying goes, if your neighbor is without a job, it's a recession. If you're without a job, it's a depression. If Obama's without a job, it's a recovery. <laughs> Acts 2.14. I know I shouldn't say certain things, but 
hey, I'm an American and I have freedom of speech. And sometimes I just like to joke around. It's not as if the White House is listening to me. And if they were, they might learn something. Or they might arrest me, one or the other. I lean toward arrest. But they don't listen to me. They don't listen to anybody. They, uh, apparently, they listen to a teleprompter. Whatever, that, that teleprompter is something else. I don't even know. Never mind. Genius thing, I guess. I guess if Obama loses, he can say, I didn't lose. My teleprompter lost. Acts 2.14. Acts 2.14. Now, this demonstrates the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And when I had my brief conversation with Moses on Obico today, I told him that I already know it. And I said, uh, you are uh, the greatest evangelist of our day, just like Billy Graham. Not as famous as Billy Graham, but uh, probably impacting. And, uh, well, I can't remember exactly how I put it. Uh, uh, probably bringing uh, or bringing as many souls toward toward Christ as... Billy Graham, and he said, oh, you know, in humility, uh, it's just the power of the Spirit, and I said, oh, I know it's the power of the Spirit, but your volition takes you to these places, and uh, so in Acts chapter 2, 14, now the power of the Spirit comes on Peter, along with 120 others on the day of Pentecost, now Peter in the past is a hothead, actually, Downstairs, I'll bring it up tomorrow. Downstairs, I have a a uh, uh, an illustration on Peter, his personality. The an illustration concerning the personality of Peter. It's very it's very uh, well. It's easy to find out once you go through the Gospels and the Acts, and you you really begin to figure out what Peter is all about. But one thing that's different about Peter and his type of personality is the fact that he had humility. Peter was gregarious. Peter talked a lot. Peter talked without thinking. Peter just would run off at the mouth just because he felt like it. And uh, he never... He never would really think of himself as arrogant sometimes, but when, but when, and sometimes he was being totally arrogant, but he could not comprehend it. But then the power of God, the Holy Spirit comes. And tomorrow there will be a contrast. I will contrast the stupid Peter from the Peter who is filled with God, the Holy Spirit. And you will see at such a tremendous difference. And the same is true today for us. Now all of us are indwelled with God the Holy Spirit. But when you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, you see a tremendous difference in that person because they're operating under a divine power, not their own. And... Uh, Sometimes people will question you about it. I've been questioned on some occasions. Uh, being at work and just working right away and not grumbling and complaining, but actually being very content at whatever I'm doing, whether machine shop or working as a, hate, a hated banker, whichever. Uh, just uh, doing what I'm supposed to do and relaxing. In doing it, and pe people have noticed it. What's going on? Is they're miserable? And uh, one guy, I actually, I actually just said, "Oh, it's these tapes I'm listening to. You want to listen to them?" He said, "Well, yeah," because he saw. Now that's a part of witnessing, by the way. Through it's experiential, but it's not you. There's no way you can claim any credit for it. It's God the Holy Spirit. If I weren't filled with God the Holy Spirit, I'd be just as miserable as everyone else in that nasty place I was working in, around nasty people with nasty attitudes. But the power of the Spirit overcomes these things. 
And there's one thing about the power of the Spirit that's phenomenal. It is not timid. It is not scared. It is not looking to compromise. Compromise, when it comes to the spiritual life, is evil. And compromise, when it comes to divine establishment, is evil. How do you compromise what God has set in place in divine establishment? You can't. And this is what many politicians are doing, and it seems as if at least some people are catching on on the divine establishment side that this compromise stuff doesn't work. How can you compromise with evil? Evil wins out every time. How do you mix good with evil? How do you mix oil with water? That's compromise. And God the Holy Spirit does not do that. God, the Holy Spirit, does not mix your human power and your human talent with its power. That would diminish the Holy Spirit to the level of an, an idiot compared to the great power he has without you. You see, God, the Holy Spirit, doesn't need you. You need him. And there's a lot that, and Christians are so arrogant, they begin to think, God needs me to do this, that, and the other. And if I don't, he will be upset. God needs me to tithe. And if I don't tithe, he will be upset. God needs me to quit uh, thinking certain sexual thoughts. And if I do not, he will be very upset with me. Guilt complex. And a lot of that's cultural, coming from the Pilgrim Syndrome and how Americans have been raised for centuries under guilt complex and that's how the weak control the strong and if you are under the power of God the Holy Spirit I'm not going to be too crass I'll just say you don't give a darn you know who you know you're under the power of the Spirit. And if you acted a fool just five hours ago and now you're under the power of the Spirit, you don't care. You don't think about the fact that you acted a fool five hours ago because now you're filled with the Spirit disregarding those things that are behind and pressing onward towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And sometimes uh, people are... Cruel. Well, not sometimes. People are just cruel. People will bring up something that you did 20 years ago that God forgave you of 20 years ago. And this often happens in the court of law. They will say, well, didn't you do so and so 20 years ago? 20 years ago? I don't even think in those terms. So... Sometimes I don't even remember. For for example, uh, I might have done some type of sin yesterday, and I named, I know I named it, but I, I don't even remember it now. I've disregarded it, and uh, and operating under the power of the Spirit. And we all have an old sin nature. And one thing we all have to understand is grace orientation, and there's a great push to move away from that. And to develop a certain type of self-righteousness and clickishness among people who used to know better, but they've lost their first love, and they've gone in for a bunch of fake Pseudo spirituality, always learning but never able to come to understand the truth. Well, let's not go with Acts 2.14. Let's go on to Acts 2.21. We went over those passages earlier, and I want to move forward. And I have my voice back. If I, I, I could not have preached last night, even though I wanted to. My epiglottis was so large, it was weird. Now it's back to normal. Now, Acts 
2.21. And this is Peter speaking under the power of God the Holy Spirit. And we will note tomorrow when we get the personality profile of Peter, when we take a look at some verses of Peter being stupid, and then we will compare and contrast Peter from that time to the first time he had contact with God the Holy Spirit and was filled with God the Holy Spirit. And you, you will find something about Peter. He becomes bold. Remember, before the Spirit, he told our Lord, Of course I love you. Of course I would never leave you. What do you mean? Then our Lord said, before the cock crowed, or three times, you will, uh, when the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. And he said, no, Lord, no. Well, he didn't have any power of the Spirit. And he was arguing with the Lord. Arguing with perfection. Arguing with omniscience. He knew that Peter was going to do it. And here's Peter in his stupidity without the Spirit saying, Lord, you're wrong. Do you know how many of you say, Lord, you're wrong all the time? It's when you listen to me and say, you're wrong. Because I guarantee you that what I teach is 100% accurate unless I have a slip of the tongue, which is possible. I'm human. And that means it wasn't intentional. But when I teach it, I know it's 100% accurate. And the authority of the pastor teacher comes from the word of God. And you better believe when I'm teaching the word of God, that's what it is. And when you say, no, no, I don't believe that. You'll say, oh, no, you sound crazy. It's like saying, no, no, I don't believe you, Lord, because it's the Bible doctrine. God, Jesus Christ wrote the Bible doctrine. Jesus Christ wrote scripture. You say, I thought there were human authors. Yes, but under the doctrine of what's called inspiration, it's actually God breathed. Jesus Christ breathed into the souls of those who were positive the scriptures. And they were written. And the Bible is still here. The oldest book in all the world. And now someone, I was at work today. And there's this very interesting uh, character that I work with. She's a, uh, she's a black lady, a believer. And a very interesting out, uh, character, funny, outgoing, um, and uh, and somehow we uh, we were all sitting around talking. Me, her, and this man who's in his uh, he's probably reaching sixty. And uh, the conversation started about how terrible things are in the country, how the economy's bad, how there are certain viruses poking up everywhere, how cantaloupe is suddenly something you can't eat. And uh, we were all sitting there, and we said, we, and we, we said to ourselves, we have no, we, when we were growing up, we never heard of such things. What What is this, and what is going on? And then that caused the uh, black lady to start talking about the tribulation. Now, she doesn't know dispensations, but she knew that there's going to be a tribulation. And uh, she said, I hope I'm gone before that happens. And I told her, I said, you will be, and I will be too. We won't see that happen. And at first, I don't think she believed me. She knew I said it was confidence. And she didn't really ask how I knew. She just said again, well, I definitely hope I'm not here. Because of all the weird things happening. And a lot of people confuse weird things happening in history with the fact that, uh-oh, it's time for the Lord to return. Let me tell you something. This is nothing compared to the Middle Ages, and the Lord did not return at that time. And really, it's nothing compared to what was going on in Paul's day. And the Lord did not return, even though Paul said he could have. 
And then I said, and then I told her again, I said, no, you will not be here. And then she said, well, no man knows the day or the hour, which is a misapplication, but, but you can still interpret it as no man knows when the resurrection is going to occur. The actual verse is referring to the second advent, and there's a general uh, thing that it's going to be seven years, but you still don't know the day or the hour. That, But still, the interpretation of the fact that we don't know is there, and she knew that. She said, well, we don't know when. And I said, yeah, we don't know when it's going to happen. And I said, that's not what I'm saying. And then I explained it to her in a very, in a way that is understandable, in a way that really clicked with me, in a way that may click with you if you're wondering, is the resurrection about to occur? And uh, is all, all these weird things that are happening, all of the, the fact that the world is changing and uh, it's not the same as it used to be when we were younger. The world always changes. It just changes much quicker when a nation like the client nation USA falls before our very eyes. That's what's happening. That's why it's strange. It's called the five cycles of discipline. And so I explained to her, I said, look, because she said, she started talking about seven year war and the tribulation. Of course, she didn't know about the first three and a half years of the tribulation as a peace movement. And I didn't bother to go into detail. I'm not there on a uh, break to uh, preach. I do enough of that anyway. But I was there to just let her know and comfort her and say that she will not be in the tribulation. And she really seemed concerned about it. And I said, uh, well, I can explain it to you this way because it was obvious she she didn't know if I was right or wrong. And I said, well, let me ask you, and she's a believer, I said, are we not am ambassadors for Christ? Yes, she said. And then I said, well, let's say the United States recalls its ambassadors for China or from China. What does that mean? And she goes to college, so she has, I mean, it's not like asking uh, somebody who doesn't know anything about history or anything else. And she said, well, it, it doesn't sound good. It seems like uh, bad relations and uh, possibly war. And I said, exactly right. The tribulation will not occur until the ambassadors are recalled. Who are the ambassadors? You, me, her, many millions and millions of Americans. And that's a good way to understand we're not going through the tribulation. The ambassadors are recalled before the war begins. Thank God for that. I don't want to be an ambassador in the middle of a war. And God's gracious, and that's what's going to happen. But not to get off subject, I just wanted to tell you that story and the fact that people do talk about the Lord uh, without, and I'm not going there, I don't even bring up the subject. They just bring it up themselves, and then I'll join in when they bring it up. Now, there's one thing I won't do at work, and it's talk about politics, and about uh, every fourth call that I get, they want to talk about Obama. And I just say... And they will go off on a tangent. And uh, this is why I am almost certain that he's going to lose because I hear it every single day. Poor people upset and going off. And uh, I'll listen to them. And I won't say much. And then they'll think that because I'm not saying much, I, I, I don't agree. So then they'll start compromising. And I say, look. You don't, you don't have to compromise. I, I just don't. I'm not comfortable talking about politics at work, especially over the phone. And then I said, but I can tell you, I, I do agree with what you're saying. You don't have to change your, your tune because I agree with you. But I just can't talk about it. I've got to do whatever needs to be done with your account. And then they say, I understand. But I hear it constantly about how terrible things are and they are terrible and it's not because of Obama I hear a lot they blame Obama he's the leader and that the buck stops here right no 
The buck stops with, uh, really, Jesus Christ. He controls history. Obama doesn't. Obama is the president because God wanted him to be president. Ever thought about that? Nothing happens without God's knowledge. No leader comes into power without God knowing it's going to happen. And don't you think if God did not want it to happen, he could stop it at the snap of his fingers? This is called the permissive will of God. God permissively allows certain things like these to happen, and sometimes intentionally, either to wake up the nation or to destroy it because it is a blight and in such total apostasy that it will cause the whole world to fall apart. So that must be dealt with, and only Jesus Christ knows how to do it perfectly. We can pontificate all we want and have our opinions, and there's nothing wrong with having your opinions. It's just the fact that we all, during this political season, which is going to be the longest political season we have ever had in American history, it's going to be one of the strangest elections you have ever seen in American history, and it's going to go on and on, and people are going to get wrapped up in it, and I can, it's going to, it's okay for you to have your opinion, it's okay for you to sit around the dinner table and talk about what's being said, but do not let that become your number one priority. Your number one priority is to listen to the word of God. To grow in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior under the power of God the Holy Spirit. Because I'm going to tell you something. Barack Obama is a blip on the radar screen just like George Bush, Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan and all the rest. Now, everybody talks about Ronald Reagan reverently, but he's gone. We're not under his authority anymore, though most people wish we were, but we're not. That's over. He's gone. A, a blo uh, just a blip in history. And what we're going through now, a blip in history. But Bible doctrine, forever. Forever in eternity past and forever in eternity future. And if you latch on to Bible doctrine, you're latching on to something that's forever. You latch on to a political campaign and forget about doctrine. I'm, there's nothing wrong if you want to be involved in politics. Just don't do it around a church. But if you let that get in the way of your spiritual life, you have just exchanged a pot of gold for a mess of pottage. So things will get political and sometimes it gets fun. That's part of being an American. It's almost like a good football game for those who love politics. I happen to love it. But I will not let it get in the way of the fact that I understand Jesus Christ controls history and I understand that Bible doctrine is the number one priority and that that goes on forever. And when I'm in heaven... Or, and, and when I come back in the millennium on the earth in perfect environment, what, what will all that politics mean then? Nothing. We finally got the perfect king. When? In the millennium. For a thousand years. Ruled under perfect leadership. It's going to be phenomenal. And so while we might whimper now and say, oh, it's terrible. And look, if you're patriotic, you should feel terrible in certain ways. I mean, our Lord wept over Jerusalem and our Lord is the one who controls history. So what he's saying by doing so is in our humanity, we are normal. We're living in the moment. We love our country. We're supposed to. And if it's going under, you weep as he did. He looked over Jerusalem, and he knew what was going to happen, vicious things that happened. If you've ever read anything from Josephus, the, the he's a Pharisee, but a great historian of his day. And the things that occurred under the fifth cycle of discipline in Israel, were, were, it will curl the hair on the back of your neck. It's worse. You think Schindler's List was bad? 
You read that, Josephus, and what happened in the fifth cycle of discipline. God, with uh, Judea, God really put it to them hard. And God will really put it to us hard because we have every single opportunity to break the shackles of our stupid arrogance and to be filled with God the Holy Spirit and to operate under God the Holy Spirit's power just as Peter does here. When he states, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. Now in this case he's referencing the deliverance from the violence of the tribulation. And no New Testament is written, so the Pharisees who were listening knew these verses, though they did not really know what knew, they did not know what they meant. Then in verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this, actually, what he says. And he's raised his voice. That comes out earlier. He says, fellow Israelites, concentrate on this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. They saw it. Verse 23. This man was handed over to you. Now he's preaching to a group of people. He has the gift of the interpretation of tongues, so he's not speaking in tongues. He's speaking directly to the Jews, to the Pharisees, the scribes, the hypocrites, and the others who are have the gift of tongues and are speaking. They are actually speaking to Jews from Gentile lands who are responding, but they're in other parts of the world. The Jews in Israel are not responding. They are ridiculing. They are projecting. They're calling them drunk and stoned at nine o'clock in the morning. Projection. And so, now imagine... You have to, you have to think, you have to put yourself, this is called putting yourself in, in, in someone else's shoes at another time, and someone else at, a, at another time in history, hermeneutics. You got to go back in history, and you've got to know the culture, and under, and, and you've got to, uh, make the story come alive. I mean, if you just read this, you'd, you'd say blah, blah, blah. I know people that think they're so great because they read the Bible so much. They don't get anything out of it because uh, it's, uh, it's well, it's like a beautiful play in some places. Like in this place. Here is Peter, who is usually impulsive, sometimes cowardly, standing up in front of the leaders, the religious leaders who Peter used to admire. The religious leaders of all Israel. Powerful people. More powerful than the people in Congress. More powerful than the people in the Senate. Because under their law, to kill someone for blasphemy was legal. And uh, who says what is blasphemy? The Pharisees, scribes, hypocrites. And Peter could have easily had his head whacked off if, if he was thinking in terms of fear. But God, the Holy Spirit, takes that away, and you're not timid, and you don't care. Now, I want, I want you to see what he says to the leaders, the very jealous leaders. And I want you to also note, as we go through it, some of them will believe. And I want you to note what it takes for them to get the message. Some people get the message easy. The, the Jewish people who lived in the Gentile nations such as Greece. They got the message e easily. And many, many, many responded and then took the gospel all around the world. It spread very quickly like a wildfire. 
But now here we're dealing with a bunch of stubborn hypocrites. And God decided to use Peter to do it. And I think that's phenomenal because all of Peter's life, he's been chewed out. Now guess what? It's his turn. Now he gets to chew somebody out. Under the power of the Spirit. Legitimate. Fellow Israelites, concentrate on this. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was a man accredited to God by by to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, and he's staring right at him. That's his audience. And he's glaring at him and shouting as it came out earlier. And some people say, oh, no, that's not that's not the way to do it. Oh, yes, it is, especially with the hard-headed legalists. It's the only way they learn. If they're ever going to learn, this is how they do it. And so he says, and you, with the help of wicked men, and what he's doing, he's comparing these Pharisees to Romans, and the Pharisees despised the Romans and thought of them as the worst sinners and scum of the earth that had ever existed as foul people. And what Peter is doing is saying, you, along with the Romans, in other words, you were, you were on the team of the Romans. Now that hit them in patriotism. And there's one thing about the, those legalists, they were patriotic. And what I'm saying is, Peter under the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit is issuing insult after insult after insult. Under the ministry of the Spirit, and he's not out of fellowship. And and you say, but don't isn't it when you give an insult, isn't that not right? Isn't that not focusing on impersonal love? Look, he's teaching to a crowd that's impersonal in itself. Impersonal love is on an individual basis. He's teaching to a crowd. Now, if he were to be walking down the street and just grab somebody off the street and start screaming at him, well, you're a nut. But he's teaching to a crowd of people. And he basically calls them out. He calls them, uh, he calls them traitors working with the Romans. He tells them that they handed over the Lord Jesus Christ. You did it with the Romans. And he says, you put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Now, we don't have time now, but I can tell you, this is a different Peter than I have ever seen since before Acts chapter 2. You can read about Peter and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all you read about is, frankly, a knucklehead. Sometimes he would get it. What did he get? What one great? What was one of the great breakthroughs that Peter had when he didn't have the Spirit? He said, Thou art the Son of God. Okay. Yes, he, he was. But, uh, oh, that's... Uh, that's simple. That's not even the milk of the word. That's the water of the word. And so he was praised for knowing the water of the word. And then because he was praised for knowing the water of the word, he went straight into arrogance because he was praised. Some people just can't be praised because they go off into a tangent on their own arrogance. They can't be praised about anything. When I was growing I learned this at an early age because uh, when I was growing up, I noticed I noticed a, a problem with myself at an early age, uh, especially around middle school. I was extremely talented in music, and I could really play the violin. I practiced really hard at it. And the more attention I got, the harder I practiced. 
And the more attention I got, the harder I practiced. And I received praise upon praise upon praise. At the same time, I was learning doctrine. But all of that was pretty attractive. And then you start thinking to yourself, I am great. Not only am I great, I'm the best. And it's arrogance. And that type, you can't praise that type. And at that time, you could say you couldn't praise me because I would absorb it and believe every bit of it. I grew out of it quickly as I grew in doctrine. And I realized all of that is a bunch of scubala. If you don't know what that word is, look it up in the Greek. That's all it is. So I had to orient myself to humility and grace as we all do. And uh, that didn't stop me from being good at playing, but it let me enjoy it much more and it let me relax. And when I would receive a compliment, I would just say thank you, but it meant nothing to me. It really meant nothing anymore. And sometimes it even got to the point it would irritate me that people would treat me differently after I would play my violin than beforehand. Beforehand, I was just some short chap. Afterwards, I was someone to talk to. I was someone to be around. I was someone that people should pay attention to. I was someone that uh, their mothers would bring their daughters up to me and say, this is a good man for you, or a good boy, being a teenager. I don't know why mothers are trying to do that at such an early age with their kids. I know why. They're thinking, this dude's going to be rich. That's what they're thinking. And that's what, what is that? Scubala. Human viewpoint. Well, Peter was that way too, and we've all been that way. And if you, some people, some of you may say, I, I've never had a talent. You have. You may have never been praised for it because certain things just aren't praised. I mean, when you walk into a beautiful home, you say, wow, what a beautiful home. But do you walk around and praise the carpenter? No. You don't even think of the carpenter. Now, after doing a little bit of putting some molding and putting down some flooring and seeing all that goes into building it and the engineering, there's even engineering and math and everything else involved in it. Now, when I look at something, I think of the carpenter and even the laborers and how it was all put together and how beautifully they made it. But how many people walk in the house and say, wow. Such great carpenters, but it is a talent. And our Lord was a carpenter, by the way. And it is a talent. It just has to do with culture today. Now, we really think great of people who can catch a football. And that is a talent, too. And uh, everybody in Indianapolis, when I was there, they about worshipped Peyton Manning. That's all you pay. He's the, he was the quarterback. He's injured now, and he's not the quarterback. And now the uh, Indianapolis has no hope of uh, going to the Super Bowl or anything else. He was a one-man team, uh, which, which was wrong. But he had so much talent in his area, he was the coach. He, you see, a coach is the one who makes the calls on the team. He was so talented that the coach said, look, I might give you a little advice on the side, but here's the earpiece. You make the call. You make the runs. You make the plays. I'll stand back and watch, and that's because the coach noticed a genius in the area of football. And that one man took the Indianapolis Colts to the Super Bowl on occasion, almost to the Super Bowl, almost to a, a, an entire winning streak, and and then when he gets injured and leaves, you find out that was a one-man team. What kind of team is that? It wasn't a team. It was a man. <laughs> now that's talent, though. 
and all of us have at least some of it and when you have talent and especially if you have an extreme amount of talent that receives praise that's a stumbling block and in Peter's case he had stumbling blocks uh, not too much about talent but he would he, he had his stumbling block was he's slow to learn and he's the ignorant and arrogant type but when God the Holy Spirit filled him he's different why he's not himself anymore he's under the power of the Spirit he's under the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and it's not he and it's not him doing it it's the power of the Spirit And once we go over this tomorrow, you will see that, and you will, and I will say, could you see Peter standing up and staring the Pharisees in the eyes and telling them that they had killed the Lord along with the evil Romans? No, you wouldn't, you would, you would not. So he said, concentrate, which is a point. But then he ha he goes on after insulting them and he gives a solution. Uh, but uh, before we go there, I want us to turn before, I'll go a little over tonight because I had to miss a day, one day due to epiglottis, another day due to lots of work, other work that I have to do. Matthew nineteen sixteen through 28. You don't have to turn there. I'll just explain what's going on. In Matthew nineteen sixteen through 28, what's the problem with these legalists who aren't legalists? They're, re they're religious. When they believe in Christ, they'll go back to religion and then they're called legalists. A Christian is a legalist who goes back to religion and a, an unbeliever is just a religionist. So in Matthew 19, 16 through 28, it describes a flaw. It describes a hang-up. It describes a hang-up becoming a syndrome. One of those hang-ups is the legalistic syndrome, and that's what these religious people had. Now, I'll use the term legalistic for them, even though they're unbelievers, because I'm teaching believers. So apply this to yourself now. Now, there's one thing about these uh, Pharisees. They were moral. But morality minus virtue equals self-righteous arrogance. I know of someone who constantly goes around and talks about integrity this, integrity that. And I know what they think of what, what integrity means. Uh, being upstanding and moral. Do you know who was the most upstanding and moral person ever in all of human history? The most religious? Saul of Tarsus. Do you know who was the greatest sinner in all of human history according to the word of God and according to the sinner himself? Saul of Tarsus. Some of you have a very, very difficult time understanding hermardiology. That means the doctrine of sin. And you constantly focus on the overt personality. And someone may be easygoing and they may be loose with their words or whatnot. And they may be totally filled with God the Holy Spirit the whole time. And then you sit there and brood and say, that is not appropriate. Who are you to say what is appropriate and what is not appropriate? Show me the scripture. You can't. You made it up yourself. So these, this is morality and tabooism minus virtue equals self-righteous arrogance. And that was the problem with the Pharisees to whom Peter was ripping them a new one. They were under the legalistic syndrome. Now, if you have a hang-up in life, and a lot of people do, Bible doctrine will get you over it. 
but it takes a lot of learning, and you can't let that arrogance get in the way. You have to accept the authority of whomever you choose as your right pastor, and as so long as he's teaching Bible doctrine, you've got to stick with it. And if you have a hang-up, that's going to be a very difficult thing. And if you have a hang-up, it becomes a syndrome. You become unstable. You don't understand the difference between morality and virtue. For morality minus virtue is self-righteousness. Now this is not to say, now some people run around and say, oh, this pastor, A.E. Lewis, he is so evil, he says that we should all be immoral. Now, did I say that? No. This is what I say. Morality plus virtue equals a problem-solving device of the protocol plan of God. Immorality is a sin and carries with it punishment. Period. Morality is for the entire human race. And for the benefit of the entire human race, believer and unbeliever. Believe you me, there are unbelievers who are far, who have fought, who demonstrate far more morality than a lot of believers. In fact, I've noticed in my generation, there are a lot of believers in my generation. And I've, uh, noticed, uh, quite some things about them. They're not of the legalist type at all. They are immoral. They are the antinomian. And uh, they're always wanting to go out and live it up. Have fun. Get drunk. Do whatever drug of choice. Sublimate. Get in fights. Cuss with each other. Become Jerry Springer types. Immorality. Now that's not virtuous, is it? No. So it's not that, it's not that, uh, you do away with morality. It's that you go beyond it. Above it. An unbeliever can be moral, but an unbeliever cannot possess virtue. Only the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ can possess Christian virtue, which is so far and above morality that it's indescribable. Morality is not an issue. In, uh, well, morality is not an issue uh, when it comes to religion. You see, all these Pharisees had turned to morality and distorted it through religion and said, our religion is morality. But God gave Israel morality, not for it to be a religion, but in order to offer a society of freedom. Thou shalt not steal. In other words, private property. In other words, and for a country that goes into socialism, guess what? You have an entire nation of thieves because they elect them. And what are they electing? They elect people with a progressive tax system who say, take it from the rich and give it to me. Evil. Totally evil. And not moral. Immoral. Now that's the issue of morality. Thou shalt not steal. But then government comes along and legalizes theft. Isn't that evil? Of course it is. But guess what? Religion's not part of that at all. What does religion have to do with that? Think about it. I hope you're following me. Morality is for the entire human race. Morality is designed to stabilize society. And we are an unstable society because of immorality. But why did it occur? 
lack of knowledge of Bible doctrine. And so we have people living with one another, hopping from bed to bed, not caring about uh, anything except uh, their own. Well, that's the way the antinomian is. They are self-absorbed, just like the legalist, just in a different way. The antinomian is all about self-indulgence. And self-indulgence is about me, me, me. You've had a bad day and you say, and instead of applying the 10 problem-solving devices, you say, I'm going to self-indulge. I'm going to get drunk. I'm going to the bar. I'm going to self-indulge because I deserve it. If you've ever seen Bill Cosby talk about it in his uh, show in the 70s, it's quite funny. He talks about, he's talking about American society at that time, which is similar to today. And he talks about people working hard all week. And then on the Friday night, they say, I've worked so hard. I deserve to go out and get drunk. So they go out to the bar. And then the next day, they are praying to the porcelain god, vomiting, and hugging on to that cold toilet. And then they say, man, we had a lot of fun. That's deceiving yourself, see. You cannot solve the problems of life with morality, though. Now, you solve the problems of Society, you solve the fact of crime, you solve the fact that there is no legalized theft of stealing from the rich who earned it and giving to the poor who did not. Just like Herman Cain said, if you're poor, blame yourself. Now that had to shock a lot of people. Who's that? What politician has ever said that? Not even Ronald Reagan. But it is a truth. Look, if you're in America, now I know times are hard now, so it's a bit different. But uh, just, a, 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 well, 10 years ago, if you had the motivation to go out and work hard, you could make money and save it. And if you had even just a little bit of a brain, you could invest it in something and make money. I know people who are dumb as dirt, and they know how to make money. I know people, it's almost like autism. Uh, who's that the guy? Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is the biggest idiot when it comes to economics than I've ever seen. Yet, uh, he is a billionaire. And you would say, how in the world could you say he's an idiot about economics when he's a billionaire? Well, I, I, I can put it to you this way. It's like autism. He knows how to do one thing. Buy and sell. Buy and sell. Buy and sell. Buy and sell. And he did. Bought low, sold high. Bought low, sold high. Bought low, sold high. Until he became extraordinarily wealthy. And that was his whole focus his entire life. Like autism. It, nothing else mattered. And just because he's very wealthy, people think he knows something. No, he's autistic. That's all he knows. He doesn't know anything else. And just because you're rich doesn't mean you know anything about economics. And then comes in hypocrisy. I should pay more taxes. Well, pay more taxes then. Run right up. But you see, this country is spending so much money. It is unbelievable, indescribable. We spend in one year in dollar bills that we don't, we borrow. We borrow in one year, not spend, but just borrow in one year enough dollars that I could stack them right now from Ohio and go toward the moon, it would go all the way to the moon, 
and all, and then you could, if you could stack it back down, all the way back to earth. That is how much we spent in debt. It's unbelievable. And it's unbelievable we're still here and have uh, at least some prosperity. I mean, I've been to two countries, Mexico and Canada, and every time I was glad to get back to America. There's no place like it. And there's still no place like it because we're a client nation, but we are under punishment, and we're about to lose it all. I was looking at some of the things, uh, some of the sheets that Baraka sends out on people listening to Colonel Thiem, and uh, just because he's now with the Lord, they don't listen. Who cares where he is? I never did. You see, that's the great thing about being a taper. It didn't matter where the colonel was. I didn't know what Houston looked like. I dreamed about, I, I had never been before until the year 2000. And I listened to Colonel Thiem, and I learned all the doctrine from uh, my pastor, Colonel Thiem, who is the greatest pastor since Paul. I don't care what anyone says. And I didn't know what Houston looked like. I didn't even know what Baraka looked like. I didn't know they had a skyscraper behind Baraka. I didn't know they had an ice skating ring on the other side. I didn't know where the barracks used to be, but I do now. I didn't know that uh, there was a big booming city all around this one church in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's not downtown. You see, when you go into Houston, you go down 59 if you're coming from the northeast, and then you go through the, uh, the city proper. Uh, downtown Houston, which is large in itself. And then you keep going, and it thins out a bit. And then you get down toward Baraka, and then you are in the poshest area of Houston. Fountains, beauty, prosperity, blessing by association. You know what that place used to be? Rice field. And people thought the colonel was crazy when he built a church in a rice field. It's not a rice field anymore. Well, I know you say you're rambling all over the place. Well, cut me some grace. I cut you some. But morality is not a problem-solving device. Morality is necessary. Of course, God created morality for the benefit of everyone, believer and unbeliever. But I'll tell you something. You can marry a believer. And you're supposed to, if you are a believer, marry a believer. But you can marry a believer who is moral and has no clue of what the spiritual life is. And I'll tell you this. Moral people do not solve their personal problems. They can't. They might try to solve what they perceive to be your problems, but they can't solve their own problems. They can't see themselves as they are, covered in dung, as the Bible describes. Man, if you only knew some of the words that are used in Scripture, one day for the you know, one day I'm going to do a message for those who, uh, it's awful funny. You can watch television and hear people cuss all over the place, even regular television today. And, uh, and, uh, you don't care. You'll hear all those cuss words all the time or cuss amongst yourselves. And then that's called Koine English. And it's a lower level of English, but they had Koine Greek too, which was a lower level of Greek. And Paul used it for emphasis. And uh, one day, I might as well, uh, for those of you who are, uh, don't have your kids around, I'll even put a warning on the message. No children allowed to listen. And then I will bring out those verses that are so harsh that the English language can barely do it. You want to know some cuss words? Well, you'll find out. And I think that would be a very interesting thing because it is the word of God. 
and uh, it's meant to be taught. So maybe one day we'll just have uh, one sermon on uh, certain things uh, related to emphasis. How the Bible uses emphasis by using curse words, as we would say. Lots of them. From the Old Testament to the New Testament. Well, the big problem with these legalists and religious people has to do with the interlocking systems of arrogance. Now, this is what we'll be talking about tomorrow as well. The interlocking systems or the interlocking system of arrogance. But just as a little bit of introduction before we get into it, I'll just uh, give you a little story and then we'll close uh, when I went on vacation, my family and I went up to a place called Holland, Michigan. And we got there, it was getting close to dark, and we were kind of tired, and it looked like a nothing place, except there were some extraordinarily wealthy people everywhere. And I'll tell you something else about uh, Holland and the people from Holland, the ancestors that moved to Michigan, they were part of a pivot. And it's interesting how there, there would be certain areas in Europe where there would be a pivot and they would just up and leave and come to the United States because they didn't have the freedom to worship as they wished. They had a heavy-handed Catholic church that would burn them to death if they said faith alone in Christ alone. Seriously, burn them alive. So they would leave. And uh, some of those came from the Netherlands. And they went to a place called Michigan, I guess, uh, so that they could have similar weather. It was it was actually probably very similar to where they live because they live near water, and it's cold. And then Michigan is right on the water where they lived, and it's cold. That's where they went. That's how they were raised. That's how they liked it. And they prospered. And you can still see the prosperity there today. I wish I would have taken more pictures of those homes so I could post them on Facebook just to show you the tremendous wealth in this one little town out of nowhere. A place you've probably never heard of. You've heard of Holland, but you've probably never heard of Holland, Michigan. Well, after we got some sleep and we got up the next day to look around, we realized this is a pretty neat place. And uh, we went to this uh, place in Holland where they have the oldest running windmill in America. And uh, the people of the Netherlands gave it to us uh, for help for winning World War II, for freeing them, liberating them. So they gave us one of their old windmills, 200 and something years old. And... It happened to be near Holland, Michigan. I don't know if it was it was close to it, if not in it. But uh, uh, my dad and I, we went and took a tour of it, and there was this lady who happened to be from the Netherlands, blonde, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes, taller, uh, just like you would imagine uh, someone from that area, and wearing the wooden shoes and uh, looking, uh, and she actually was from Holland, and she uh, went through the whole building, and uh, on the surface of it, if you were to look at a picture, you would say, ah, a windmill. But if you were to go into it, you would say, wow. We're talking about something that was built 200 and something years ago that had some technology and some engineering that is uh, quite amazing. But we're talking about something that, that's running off of wind. And... They had these huge blades. When the wind would blow, they would turn, and then it would turn these very, very, very heavy tons and tons of wood would turn. And they had this special type of wood. I forget the name of it. What was the name of that wood? I don't remember the name of the wood. Extremely hot. Iron wood. Iron wood, that's right. It's not iron, it's wood, and they got it from a special tree, and uh, they had this iron wood that would weigh a ton, 
And through this, the wind would spin it, and it would do its thing, and uh, it lasted for 200 years uh, before it got uh, before it wore out. Now, sometimes iron will wear out before then. Anyway, what they had once we got to the top were interlocking systems. And uh, once what it is, the wind would blow the the what I guess you would call it a prop. I call it a prop. I don't remember what you would call it. The windmill. They would turn it. And then that would turn the wooden things that were on the inside, and they would have notches in them, gears. And then you could pull up, if you wanted to pull up something, some grain from the bottom, you would take it and interlock it with one of the gears that was moving, and it would pull it up. And at the same time, you could interlock something else with it, and it would do something else. And then you could interlock so many things and have so many things working at once, you have to, you, you actually had to be trained to know how to do it. The, the person who was operating the windmill, it, it's still in operation. They still do make flour. Uh, it took them uh, two years of, uh, study in the Netherlands to learn how to use this massive engineering feat. And it all was based on an interlocking system. Well, Satan's a genius. And he has an interlocking system. And you can jump into that interlocking system very easily. Very easily. And, uh, for example, let's say, the wind blows. That's adversity. The wind blows. Uh, you complain. One wheel begins to turn. You're out of fellowship. One will of the system of arrogance. And then you're complaining and grumbling. And then you, uh, as a result, uh, someone else beside you is happy. And you look at them and you despise them for being happy because you're miserable. You interlock another gear. And then uh, you're bitter and... Uh, who knows? Well, I'll give better examples later. But they just start interlocking. Or or then it goes from you look at this person who's happy and you have a mental attitude, a uh, sin of hatred toward them. And so that interlocks with a gear. So now you've got two things spinning. And then somebody else walks up who is also miserable. So you turn to them and gossip about the happy person. And then you pull in the verbal sins and interlock that. And then, uh, let's say the person that you're looking at is in a position of authority, maybe your husband. Then you pull in authority arrogance, interlock with that. That makes you unteachable. And then... You pull in self-righteous arrogance or self-justification. I have a right to be upset. It's windy up here and cold and I'm angry. And I have a right to be. You interlock something else. Now that would be one way. Or you could have, you could be an antinomian and interlock, in a, and interlock into arrogance in a different way. For example, you could walk into the room where they were giving the demonstration and you see the woman from the Netherlands and you notice she's quite attractive and you have a sexual thought, sexual arrogance. And uh, if you're like David, you then take her as he took Bathsheba and it was actual rape. You might not know that, but it was, the first time anyway. So then there's uh, the thought of it, and then it interlocks, interlocks with the actual rape, and that becomes criminal arrogance, interlocks with that. And then you have uh, the fact, once they all interlock together, and they all, all start moving together, and the adversity of life is always out there, and the wind's always blowing, 
And so here you are in the interlocking systems of arrogance and it's all turning. And guess what? Uh, the last thing that hooks up to it, psychopathic arrogance. The arrogance of unhappiness. Preoccupation with self. All of these things interlock. It's not just one thing. It's very rare that you'll find somebody who simply has a mental attitude sin but doesn't gossip. Actually, I think it's nearly impossible. If you have a mental attitude sin about somebody, unless you rebound within the next five minutes, within the next ten minutes, you're going to criticize that person personally or talk about that person behind their back. You've just interlocked. Middle attitude sin, interlocked verbal sin. So we will study that, the interlocking systems of arrogance, and that's the one thing that uh, was keeping these religious Jews from believing. They were all caught, caught up in the interlocking systems of arrogance, and Peter had to shout and call them murderers because he couldn't. That was the only way he could get through that iron wood. Their heads. Their iron wood heads. Hard as iron. But he got through some of them. And if he had not had taught, if he did not teach in that manner, if he had taught uh, without without using the insult, they were he was insulting without, but he was telling them the truth. But to them, it's an insult, but still the truth. And the only way to deal with those people who have that iron wood head, a hard noggin, is with utilizing the power of the spirit and not being timid. That's why I shout quite a bit. I don't do it all the time. Sometimes uh, there are times that I just don't want to shout because uh, it's something I haven't noticed as a problem and uh, it's something that needs to be given in a different way and maybe this time it's for encouragement uh, in a positive way. Next time maybe you need encouragement from a negative standpoint, negative as in being, uh, stop doing that. You do that with your children. You say, stop it. Don't do that. Now that's negative reinforcement. And then when they stop doing it, what do you do? You say, good boy. Come here, give me a hug. Good job. What's that? Positive encouragement. And you do both when you raise children. Now, why would it be so shocking that a shepherd, which is the title of a pastor, who loves his sheep, why wouldn't he have a, have a rod to keep him in line and a staff to protect? And uh, that's why King David had such a sense of responsibility. And I tell you, King David loved those sheep, the, the animals. He loved those animals. And he was going to protect them no matter what. And when one of the sheep would get out of line and go off somewhere, he would use the rod, spank them back. And the sheep didn't like it. But the sheep was safe. And some of you have to realize that uh, growing up in this culture in America, everything is arrogance. I'm bad. You know it. You know, all of that, it's all been part of our culture. I'm macho. Nobody's going to talk to me that way. I've heard that before. I, <laughs> I overheard, I used to teach in this place, and I overheard uh, a conversation. They didn't know I overheard it. And I heard the lady say, nobody will talk to me that way. So I went in there. And I not only talked to her that way, but in about three different other ways. And she didn't say a word. So somebody will talk to you that way. And it's reproof and correction. And arrogance says, no, I don't need reproof. I don't need correction. I'm just fine the way I am. And no, you're not. And neither am I. We've got to grow. And it's time to grow 
spiritually, and it's time to uh, get this thing moving in terms of a pivot. Well, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, see, I just made up for yesterday. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us as to the importance of his power, the power of the Spirit, as to the importance of the fact that it is the power of the Spirit that has the authority. Of, uh, to wake us up to the importance of the fact that it was the power of the Spirit that chewed out the people Peter chewed out. It wasn't even Peter. Peter didn't even have it in his bones to do it, no more than I do. Well, Father, we thank you for the privilege of studying these things. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.